Uh, so this is the um, the webinar sponsored by the Decide Method Center, which is funded by AHRQ, uh, with the purpose of uh, enriching the uh, methodologic background knowledge among investigators uh, of the Decide um, uh, network. And um, we have uh, several webinars coming up. Um, I'm just uh, looking in the future here. November 15th is um, Dr. Johnson from Kaiser talking about challenges in predictive uh, modeling. And then the month later in December, we have uh, a talk on sensitivity analysis and comparative effectiveness research. That's like myself. Uh, and, but um, much more importantly, today uh, we have Dr. Mark Vanderlein from University of California, Berkeley. Uh, and uh, he is uh, on the forefront, actually, the developer of um, what is called targeted maximum likelihood estimation. Uh, related uh, methodologies in, in that space, uh, I think a technique that uh, we as uh, applied investigators should be very much aware of um, as an alternative to many of the things that we are doing. Uh, and so it's really a, a, a pleasure to have uh, Mark present and share his experience with us today. Um, and I hope this will uh, spur some questions and, uh, and maybe all, only to uh, um, trigger some thoughts uh, for future um, reference, uh, and then you might want to get in touch with Mark uh, when you decide that you want to learn more about this methodology and apply it to your own research. So uh, Mark is a professor of biostatistics, University of California, Berkeley, and uh, I won't uh, waste any more time. Uh, we hope that Mark is speaking for maybe 35, 40 minutes or so, and then we have still some time for, for discussion and questions for Mark. All right, Mark? Okay, Christian, thank you so much. Uh, I'm assuming I, you can hear me clearly? Yes. Okay, thank you for the introduction, and uh, it's a real pleasure for me to give this talk. It's so personal to not see an audience, but uh, I will just imagine one. Okay, so the title of the talk <coughs> is uh, Targeted Make Some Likelihood Estimation in Comparative Effectiveness Research. Let me start with an uh, acknowledgement. Uh, this is a uh, uh, presentation uh, which is kind of extracted from an earlier presentation in Barcelona, which was prepared jointly with Sam Lendl, a PhD student, and up here, and Bruce Feyerman for Kaiser Permanente. And some of that uh, research data analysis of Kaiser data set is presented here. It's also based on a long research with a variety of uh, students, and I'm not naming them, former students, and I'm not naming them all. Named Dan Rubin, uh, who's working at the FDA, uh, who on target makes some light estimation originally. Uh, Gruber, who is now at Harvard, uh, who worked uh, uh, on the collaborative target makes some likelihood machinery we'll talk about. Poli at NCI, who is, uh, has a whole package on super learning, so he did a lot of work on that during his PhD. Uh, Rose, uh, who uh, is now at Johns Hopkins as an NSF postdoctoral she is also this co-author of this, this uh, book with invited chapters we wrote um, and, and will refer to as well, which is, is reference for a lot about this uh, more general methodology. And, and anyway, there are so many others. I thank them all. Okay. <clears throat> I'm uh, uh, in a hurry to finish this talk, so we'll just see how far we get in the 30, 40 minutes. I think we should uh, be, certainly be able to cover uh, the basics. Uh, I will first do an uh, introduction, a motivation. Why do we even worry about a new, new template for learning from data, uh, which we call targeted learning? Uh, we'll talk about the two ingredients of this whole targeted learning methodology, which involves first super learning and then an corresponding targeted makes some likelihood uh, update. Also, collaborative target makes some light estimation, which is in, in refined, uh, if you want, but still fits into the target makes some likelihood framework. Uh, and we'll start looking at some uh, data sets and simulations based on data sets. And if we have time, we'll talk about complex analysis we have done, uh, which is involving trying to get the causal effect of uh, warfarin on uh, developing stroke within a year, uh, or these kind of analysis, which involve treatment, but also right ring that people drop out in response to time-dependent covariance. 
we have a methodology developed for that as well. Uh, the traditional approach has been very much based on paradigmatic uh, regression models, and, and that has, of course, issues because none, none of us knows which one to choose a priori. So what we usually do is we just try a bunch, and then at a certain point we'll probably find one which gives a reasonable result, which we can put in a paper and publish, uh, and report the point estimate but then the coefficient uh, as this paradigmatic model was a priori specified. And uh, this is just a product of uh, have such a limited tool available to you, uh, that's what's going to happen and what people will be doing. And, but of course, as a consequence, we cannot talk about serious statistical inference anymore. Uh, the problems are that the parametric model is misspecified, uh, even though you try to get the right one. Uh, but, and, and, but the parameter estimates are still interpreted as if the model was correct. And the inference does not take into account there was model selection confidence levels and p-values are, are wrong. Well, they were already wrong because things were biased, but uh, even wrong. So that's the problem. So for that purpose, uh, we have to go back to the very basics of what the paradigm of statistical inference. Now, it's a, it has a, uh, a framework of thinking. The number one is that your observed data is a random variable. In other words, it's a relation of an experiment and uh, has a certain probability distribution. Then a statistical model is just tells us what do we know about restrictions of that probability distribution of the data. But the idea of the statistical model has always been, even that all got uh, with the correct practice, uh, but the idea has always been that the statistical model should represent assumptions we actually know to be true. So the statistical model should contain the true probability distribution of the data. It should not include restrictions which we know are false. So right here, you cannot use parametric models anymore because we don't know our uh, treatment uh, is confounded uh, and how, how our part is a function of, of uh, treatment and covariates and confounders. Uh, the problem is now, since you're going to work with large statistical models, if you want, so these semi-parametric models, which are only incorporating knowledge we know, which is often not much. We cannot define our target parameter anymore, our estimate, as just a coefficient in a parametric model or semi-parametric model. We have to define it as a particular function of the probability distribution of the data. So you start getting into the non-parametric definition of what we mean with our target, like a causal effect, our target. If we agree what feature of the probability distribution of the data we want to learn, uh, the estimation problem is defined. It's defined by the statistical model and this mapping from the probability distribution into your feature of interest, your estimate. So now estimators. And again, estimators are a priori specified algorithms. They are not something you can just start playing around with during the data analysis and having meetings and then adjust it again. No, it needs to be a priori specified. And we can evaluate that a priori specified algorithm by properties, statistical properties such as bias and variance, so based on a an, an, an performance assessment, we can decide what estimator would be optimal and best and, and most unbiased and that kind of thing. So how does causal inference come in here? Now, causal inference is, 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 is it's not a statistical model. It's about what we'll think of as modeling, that you think of your probability that there is an underlying experiment and they observe data is just a product of that underlying and so when we call the inference, for example, we might say we believe that for every unit, every patient, there are treatment-specific outcomes and covariates, and that represents the full data, the so-called counterfactuals, and for observed data that we only see counterfactuals, namely the one corresponding with the treatment that person actually took. So that's called the neyman rubin uh, causal model. But all it does, it parameterizes the probability distribution of the data in terms of the distribution of these counterfactuals and the the continued distribution of treatment given uh, the full data. And, uh, and there are other common models, such as the structural equation model, uh, we'll talk about in this, uh, which are, in, in some senses, uh, result in equivalent uh, estimates and estimation and interpretations. So I'm going to get into a discussion of what kind of causal model is better, just about uh, a choice you make. 
mind, however, uh, that though this causal modeling is extremely important because it allows us now to the causal quantities of interest in this later world, and we can, under certain assumptions, establish identifiability. That means we can write this causal effect of causal quantity as a function of the distribution of the observed data. That's called identifiability result. And therefore, now we have defined a statistical estimate, which believe these causal assumptions can be interpreted as a causal effect. And are, for example, the randomization assumption, no unmeasured confounding assumption, and you need usually a positivity assumption. You need some experimentation. For get an effect of treatment uh, versus control, you need some people taking both and for every value of the confounder. Now, we don't believe these causal assumptions. We have that estimate, and that estimate that still represents an interesting statistical parameter. It represents the effect of the treatment on the outcome, controlling for all the measured confounders. There's still a very interesting statistical parameter, and that is the one we are going to get anyway, even when these causal assumptions are wrong. If you think of particular ways of interpreting this, that might be that you say it's the best we can do of getting to as close as possible to that causal effect, get observed data. And so it is still a very interesting quantity to go after. Uh, so that our causal inference. Um, turning. Is, is, is now is concerns how do we do this estimation of this target parameter, this estimate. And uh, all in the context of large semi parametric models. So, in other words, you make very few assumptions about the data generating process, only the ones you actually know. And interesting target parameters can come from causal modeling, and, and then that way establish these, uh, these estimates which actually have causal interpretations. Uh, how we need to know do we construct such estimators? Uh, and suddenly, uh, uh, like a very specified paramedic model is not an option uh, because of the fact that it will respect your actual knowledge. Your knowledge is much weaker than that, and there you are for sure getting a very biased, potentially biased estimate. So what the learning is about is to actually construct estimators which are fully taking into account what the statistical challenge is, what the real estimation problem we need to address. And we try to construct uh, estimators which are uh, optimal, so-called asymptotically efficient, and maximally robust for all possible data generated in that statistical model. And so, in a way that allows us to do statistical inference. Now, in the methodology targeted learning, the way we set it up is, is, is a stage methodology. Uh, first stage involves adaptive estimation, so-called super learning, and the second stage involves the term makes some likely to update. Uh, it, can, it is a very generic approach. It's a template, a template for construction of estimators for these large models for, est for certain uh, estimates. It can apply to any estimation problem. So we use it, and we have used it, for estimation of causal effects, of uh, static treatment regimens, uh, but also dynamic treatment regimens, uh, direct, indirect causal effects, uh, marginal fitting the parameters of a marginal structural model, uh, variance analysis where you want to get the effect of, an, of, an, of like a, a SNP or a variable separately. You want to get the effect of one, controlling for all other SNPs or uh, these kind of things. Uh, we handle repeated measures, uh, time-dependent confounding, censoring, missingness, case control studies, and so on. As if by now literature applies this methodology to all these estimation problems. Grow. Okay, <clears throat> so the two stage methodology involves uh, a first stage uh, super learning. Uh, that is an uh, aim uh, we used, we started using in, in uh, I think, around 2007 uh, when we came out with a paper on that. Uh, and uh, implied by, by, by Oracle result, and that's why we came all result, which proves asymptotically that the methodology is asymptotically exactly as good as just using the best estimator among a large class of estimators. So it's on uh, first coming up with a library of candidate estimators, and that can include all your paramedic models you want to use, but also a lot of machine learning algorithms available in the machine learning and computer science literature. Such as random forest and so on, and it uses cross-validation to, to build 
weight combinations of all these candidate estimators. Of the candidate estimators. Find the best weighted combinations based on cross validation. Now that gives us an initial uh, estimator of the wrong part of the distribution of the data. And the second stage concerns the target makes some light estimation, which takes SuperLearner as an initial estimate. And of course, you don't have to use SuperLearner if you don't want to, but that's what we do. Uh, and and uh, fluctuates it in a direction according to a parametric model with, with a so called fluctuation uh, parameter in such a way that when you now fit that parametric model, you fit that amount of fluctuation, that optimal, that, that model is such that that and fluctuation really removes bias for your target parameter of interest. That, that uh, fluctuation model is all about fitting the target parameter of interest. So it's a very targeted bias reduction step. And that is updated super learner, and then you use your, your estimate. And that's the story. Technical inference as well. What is Uh, all results. It's just it's just a tool. It's it's cross validation. So you have a library of uh, candidate estimators, and you uh, you you train them all on uh, three samples, and then you evaluate uh, them on the validation sample, and use the best one based on cross validated risk. So this all depends on what is best. That need depends on the choice of loss function. It could be the likelihood loss function, it could be the squared error loss function, it could be whatever your goal is. Uh, but is the and then, of course, when we do cross validation, we use multi fold cross validation that we don't rely on one split. Proof that, in fact, the sector obtained by cross validation is not exactly as good as the so called oracle sector, which will be God who just knows the truth and therefore knows which animate is close to the truth for that sample. And so you get that we are totally exactly equivalent with that. So not just getting the same rate of convergence, but even the same constant. So that's a very powerful result. And it's changed the perspective of how you do prediction, but also how you do this adjustment for confounders. Changed the whole perspective because it means we should be throwing all sorts of approaches at it and not bet on one, but let the data figure out which one works best. And this still works. This asymptotic equivalence result still holds up even when the number of candidate estimators grows with size like a poly polynomial power, like uh, e to the power of five or something. So that we can actually handle for the kind of data sets like uh, we, we are, we're talking about in comparative effectiveness research, we can handle more estimators than we can computationally right now. And so theoretically, it can be done. Uh, we actually not just choosing the best, uh, you know, a more library of estimators, we are also finding the best weight combination. And that's Oracle that still applies to that as well. So really looking at an infinite family of estimators. Uh, to to uh, give you a, a demonstration, here's an, a, a simple simulation study involving four data distributions. The goal is prediction of an outcome based on, on covariates. And you hear a few algorithms, least squares, uh, SU, LARC, uh, uh, DSA, DSA is a an, binomial an regression algorithm uh, uh, developed by Roy Neugebauer and, and uh, Sandra Sinisi. Uh, regression, random forest, um, MARS. And these are the candidate algorithms. And then uh, the super is just using cross validation to choose the best one among them for that data set. And cross validation, and then what we are rep reporting here is the actual relative mean squared error, uh, which is true one. So it's actually based on an infinite test sample. What you see here is that Mars is the winner among the candidate estimators, but SuperLearner does as well as Mars. Then for study, the best one is random forest. Learner, which takes some weighted combination of these algorithms, actually achieves some performance which is even better. Then in study three, Mars is again the best, and super as well. And in study four, it's actually DSA algorithm which is the best. And super learner, by somehow weighting uh, estimators, it, it does too as well. A lot of mean squared error. So overall, if you take it across four data sets, you see that 
the learner outperforms any of the individual algorithms. And that's really the game. Every for a single data set, there might indeed be an algorithm which is as good or even better than the super learner. The problem is you don't know which one it is. So if you bet on that algorithm and you keep using that across all your studies, you are going to lose relative to something which is adaptive, based on the data. Here's an, uh, based on real data, this was a study carried out by Air Poly, all getting a whole collection of publicly available data sets of relatively small sample sizes ranging from 200 to 500. And he has a learner using a library of, of these algorithms which are listed here. And uh, it is evaluating through cross validation uh, which algorithms, which these algorithms uh, are, uh, what actually performs is across the 15 publicly available data sets. So these, that's what you see on every row. You see, the, uh, you see these uh, dots, they represent the 15 data sets. Uh, they are one means you're doing as well as linear regression, and, and if to the left of one, you're beating linear regression. And so you see, uh, you have to have all these dots for a particular algorithm on the left of one, uh, and the red one is the mean. Now you see that the mean is is, is the performance measure across the 15 data sets, and you see that the super learner one, and it's ordered in that way. So the discrete super learner, which actually just chooses uh, the candidates instead of a weighted combination, does slightly worse, but still the best after that. And they, uh, big regression trees comes down and so on and so on. Just as, a, as an illustration, uh, take for example Bayesian regression trees, right? Fantastic algorithm, but in particular data set, it was horrible, right? And that's what the super avoided uh, by just noticing that that data set, oh, I shouldn't be using this algorithm, so I'm choosing something else. And that's where the wins come from. So here is a visual uh, presentation of what the target makes some likelihood is about. What I plot here is circle is uh, then the statistical model. These are the set of possible probability distributions of your data. P is the true probability distribution we know, and uh, then we have our data we can map into an initial estimator of our probability distribution. So could ever be using the super learning. And really we focus on relevant part of the probability distribution. And we estimate that. Uh, and what we care about is not P0, it's not the probability distribution of the data, we care about a element, a function applied to P0. It's the so-called target parameter. That's the psi. Psi P0 maps into the line, they, it represents this, uh, you know, like the additive causal effect of treatment, at least this causal assumption, but it's just an estimate. That uh, is the truth is reported here on this line. And we care about doing Getting that our plug-in estimator, right? We our psi, for example, applied to this initial estimator maps into this number, pretty far away, say, from the true estimate. What we care about is, is not how good the initial estimator is or how good the estimator is of the data data gene distribution. It's about the, how good our corresponding plug-in estimator is of a parameter of interest. But in the second stage, the TA, is to update the initial estimator, move it into direction, and that is chosen so that it really, you move it along that direction, it changes the parameter a lot, the target parameter, and find the optimal amount of far we should move in direction. And then you get this updated estimator, the PS star, and if you now take the psi of PN star, then suddenly you get closer to the truth, because it's tailored for minimizing mean squared error for the parameter of interest. So that's all game of target makes some likelihood. Then to really scare people off, uh, I have a slide here. That's just to demonstrate this action, a very general formal template we go through when we do this for every problem. So, uh, you don't look at this, but this is what the game is. You say, hey, let's find, let's describe our estimate and mapping of a part of the distribution of the data. That's the psi of Q0. So Q0 is the relevant part. So that's the first step. Then we estimate that relevant part of the distribution of the data, that's the Q0. We use space super learning, because our parameter, that Q0 can be described as a minimizer of a loss function, of a risk of a loss function. And we, curse, we construct a parametric submodel with parameter epsilon. So at epsilon is zero, you get your original estimator, your initial estimator, but when epsilon moves away, it, it changes it in a direction. 
fluctuation model might actually depend on a nuisance parameter, like in our case, like a treatment mechanism. And it's chosen in such a way that if you look at the score of your fluctuated initial estimator at low fluctuation, you have a so-called efficient score, which characterizes an efficient estimator parameter of interest. So this is the formal way of saying that, an, that an, one of the fluctuation models is optimal. Now, then we can fit the amount of fluctuation with just plain some likelihood, parametric makes some likelihood. That's an updated initial estimator. We can iterate that and end up with an updated Q star. And then we just do the plug-in estimator, psi of Q star, and that's it. And that's, our, that's the target makes some likelihood estimator. <coughs> Collaborative team come in here. Collaborative target makes some likelihood estimation. about how it fits the estimate of this nuisance parameter, which is going to be, in our case, like if we care about the causal effect of a treatment on an outcome, a treatment mechanism, the dispensary score, and the propensity score needs to be fitted. Now, if you just fit it based on the likelihood of the propensity score, you will also be including, for example, variables which are like instrumental variables, which predict treatment but have nothing to do with the outcome. That's a problem. But the question is, can we do a better trade-off for fitting that nuisance parameter, which is need for this fluctuation model in the target mix and likelihood. So the propensity score actually in a way that we add coverage which actually matter and which help us get good bias reduction in our TML. For that purpose, we have we, uh, soon implemented a forward uh, stage, uh, algorithm, which, uh, which with forward solution selects one variable at a time in propensity score, and it evaluates based on if you add that variable, you get a new fit of the propensity score. It then checks how is this working for target mix of likelihood, it's getting a good bias reduction, and it does then, and then it chooses the best one, and then chooses that variable, and then it keeps iterating that process. And so that way you get a, a, a sequence of propensity score. It's growing in dimension with more and more variables added. And speaking, it's the instrumental variables which have an extremely hard time to get in, uh, but it's the real founders which are getting the preference. And then use cross validation to select uh, how far, again, cross validation based on what we care about, actually, which is our target select estimator of the Q part of the likelihood. Uh, we use validation to decide how many variables should be added into that propensity score. And, and so, uh, and then our fit for the tree mechanism, and then we use the corresponding target mix and likelihood estimator, and that's it. Uh, that is, uh, there's, uh, I give you a few references to these original papers on this topic, and uh, you can, they're also listed in the back. Okay, so then, uh, we also wanted to get involved into uh, the evaluation of target maximum likelihood in, in a context of a lot, lots of other estimators people have used, and there was in particular a debate going on at the time King and Schaefer, which was about demystifying double robust estimators, where they came up with simulations and used these simulations to demonstrate that simple weighted least, uh, so least squares regression was doing as well as these complex double robust uh, uh, estimators. And, um, but in the original paper, target makes some likelihood, uh, at least not in the way it should be done, was included. So we wrote a paper, this is by Porter, Gruber, yes, second. Uh, myself, uh, we started including all these estimators and also the target makes some like, and also the collaborative target makes some like into the story. Uh, so what we did, we used their simulation, but then we also uh, looked at modifications of their simulations where we made the challenge bigger by the estimation of the mean of an outcome, but where the mean is subject to missingness, and we also observed covariates. That was the simulation. So uh, the, the target some likelihood involves now regressing the outcome one on the curves W among the complete observations. And, uh, then it does an update. It adds some clever covariate to that regression, where covariate involves one over the probability missingness, this G, and that's T and, and of course, it, it plugs in into getting for the mean of Y, in order to just average out over the covariate. And that's how T and would work. And then we get a collaborative target mix like by being more clever of how you select your covariate in your business mechanism fit, and so the uh, setup. But then in the modifications, we made missing this uh, more confounded, and then the modification 
two were we included covariates which uh, had no effect on y. There we create this this challenge of how do you avoid instrumental variables that you would expect CTML to start doing much better. You know, can uh, for simulations, and um, you see here uh, these estimators presented. You see that the least squares estimators just doing plain least squares according to a parametric model is actually better. And uh, most these other estimators are. I mean, it's not that dramatic. Uh, TML, CTML, they're all. Uh, I mean, doing fine. The more interesting if we make it more serious, uh, more confining, and start seeing that the least squared becomes horribly biased, uh, and then least squared, which is another double boost procedure because it uses weights, one over the missing as the mechanism, is, is, is some biased. Uh, estimate equation, augmented IPCW is somewhat biased. What you see is that the uh, team of Hold. It's rather unbiased and, and keeps spread intact. And that's because it's a plan estimator. But DTML really is doing a good job uh, by being a little more smart about how you, what overage you add into the missingness mechanism, to this automated procedure. And then, case two, this gets even more serious, where you are now seeing that CTML is just clearly forming uh, any of these other uh, animators uh, through magnet. So now I want to talk <coughs> about a uh, data example, uh, which was with uh, a colleague with Bruce Feyerman and, and Sam Lendl. Uh, so this involves uh, the following data set. It's, it's part of the FDA mini Sentinel drug safety surveillance project. It's concerns, in this case, a population of diabetic patients uh, with higher cardiovascular disease. New uses of two drugs. Uh, we're comparing here. And one we call AS1, one we call AS0. They're followed up for at least six months, starting the other drug. Uh, we are, the outcome is just a binary outcome. It's the myocardial infarction in six months. And a bunch of baseline covariates, uh, 50, uh, uh, including demographics, comorbidities, and other drug use, and so on. This uh, core modeling work, you would say, OK, uh, we, have, we are going to assume a new parametric structure equation model, which is uh, COVID treatment and outcome, which are sequentially generated. So you first generate a set of errors that you use. Gives you have a deterministic system generating a W, the covert, the treatment, A, outcome, Y. A non parametric structure equation model. Uh, you, and then that can be used to define counterfactuals by just setting, replacing the equation A, an issue of your choice. In this case, you might do a static intervention, like you set A equal to small a, like 0 or 1. That could create a new set of equations, just uh, where the A equation is replaced by A equals A. And that's now, that defines a new random variable, Y-A, you might call. And that's, that's just the F-Y, divided now where A is set equal to A. Otherwise, it's the same random variable as we, uh, uh, equation as for Y. But then the factual. And you then say, I care about uh, comparing uh, the outcome in the world where everybody uses A is 1 in population versus everybody uses treatment is 0. And that's the additive causal effect, for example. And that might be your problem of interest. Then you're concerned, can I learn that from the data? Now, the data is observed. That's the W, A, and Y. But we don't, of course, know anything about the use, these unmeasured factors. So you need assumptions about these unmeasured factors not causing you a lot of trouble. And, for example, the no unmeasured confounding assumption says that Errors going into A should no relation to the unmeasured errors going into Y, even W. And so, if you make that assumption, that's a randomization assumption, then you prove that your additive causal effect can be written as purely a statistical estimate, a conditional mean of the observed outcome Y, uh, addition of treatment and covariates, setting treatment is one, averaging, setting treatment is zero, and averaging. Uh, so we then used a target mix like an estimator of that estimate. And again, that is nothing else than running regression of the on the covariance. So that's like a lo it's a logistic regression, but we can use super learning for that. And then we would update that logistic regression by using <coughs> the current super learner fit as offset. 
En Munich Wert Logistic Regression is een clever co-wert. En de clever co-wert is, is de indicator A is 1 uh, divided by the propensity score minus the indicator A is 0 divided by 1 minus the propensity score. That's the co-wert. And then you fit the coefficient in front of that clever co-wert. You get updated logistic regression. You plug it in. You average and you get your estimator. It's an example. So here are the results from the data analysis using these different estimators. Uh, you see there were 91 cases, 91 units. Uh, uh, I went to 7,000. Uh, the group had a few thousand subjects. The comparator had 25,000 subjects. Added uh, just the difference in proportions, <coughs> unadjusted. It's like 1,000. Uh, you start using these uh, estimates, which try to adjust for confounding. They, it becomes smaller, so the effect sinks towards zero. But no means we are able here to make much of a statement, uh, which is, has any statistical significance because of this, the standard errors are just too big. So there's not enough events. We decided to uh, now because we don't have the full-blown Sentinel project data set available yet. Uh, so that we need more data, clearly, to, to start looking at these cases. Uh, said, okay, let's do some simulations. And let's simulate based on this data set. And what we did, we uh, uh, we sampled the covariates from the empirical distribution of the covariates. And then simulate treatment from a new function of these baseline covariates. And we make the outcome only a function of these covariates. Treatment. So we know there's no effect of treatment. And that's the simulation, where at least we know the truth is zero, zero effect. <coughs> uh, and then we can play games, uh, such as uh, we know now the mechanism for treatment, we know the mechanism for the outcome, we know all these, these regressions, so we can misspecify them in these different estimators, such as IPTW, propensity score, uh, and so on, which, and target makes like estimation, and we can see Uh, what processes are, are, are demonstrated in that manner. And so in simulation, we just wanted to demonstrate the robustness. So what you see here, that if you use, for example, propensity score matching, misspecified propensity score, you have some bias of 0.01, right? The, the unadjusted will be 0.05. Uh, here it's like 0.06. But if you start using estimators which are double robust, then that by and you are at least getting one of them right, either the outcome regression or the propensity score, you are reaching your bias. And in general, the bias becomes a product of two errors. Is how What's the error in getting the propensity score right, and what's the error in getting the outcome regression right? So you are getting second-order bias, and that's why you do this. Uh, second simulation, we, wa we are having a covariate that is very predictive of treatment, but it's not predictive of outcome. It's a problem for estimators which use uh, the propensity score. They don't like And so we would hope to see that T doesn't blow up that much, right? Even, but that CTMLE is really going to do much better. And what you see is that, that the IPT estimator <coughs> uh, is having uh, large uh, fitness issues. Uh, look at the mean squared error here, all right? 1.46. Uh, well, TMLE has a mean squared error of 0.08. The estimating equation methodology starts having real problems because it is not a plug-in estimator, so it's not bounded, it's not respecting constraints of the model. And then similarly, it's, it's uh, clearly doing the best with a mean squared error uh, by just being smarter about what covariates to include. Uh, in the simulation, uh, we want to demonstrate that super learning to fit these propensity scores is, is important as well. Right? And this gets to the work, for example, of uh, Sebastian as being, you know, maybe we should not be using these parametric propensity score models. We should be much more accurate about it and much more data depth about it. So that's where super learning can also come in to do that. And is that important in simulations, but also in practical data sets? <laughs> There's definitely more to do there. And, and theoretically, the answer is yes. And, and I think we definitely want to demonstrate, uh, hope to see that in practice, we can make a difference in this manner. So you see, for example, uh, that he used an, an uh, uh, 10,000 here. 
use TMLE and use the propensity score with main terms only, you get a bias of 0.01. While if you do TMLE using propensity score with SuperLearner, you move that bias, and it's just a perfectly fine estimator, not so biased. So why do this uh, at every level? So you are talking, when you talk about target mix and line estimation, it is about super learning for the propensity score, super learning for the outcome regression, even doing potentially cold target mix so like to do a little smarter what variables to include in the propensity score. And we have still the TMLE update. And that is all about an effort of minimizing the bias so that actual statistical inference becomes a sensible thing to do. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how are you doing, Sebastian? Because I could stop here, uh, depending on time. Uh, I could show a few more things. Why don't we take a break here uh, and see how many questions we have and clarifications, and then if there's time left, then uh, we go on for, yeah. to section six. So, uh, so any questions from the audience? Uh, I think we have given the um, read up the microphones, right? Yeah, Mary, give the thumbs up here, so you can just speak up um, if you're on a telephone. Sebastian, why don't I start out with a question? Yeah, yeah. Question there in the background? No. Right, this is Chinese. All right. Uh, anyway, so um, so uh, my question is, and I think many others in, in our room here have the same question. You have this one slide where you show the circle and all these arrows going through there, and there is in the in this circle something is happening where you move the parameter, right? Uh, um, uh, along and move it closer to the truth, right? And um, I think there's a lot happening how you move that closer to the truth, these efficient influence curves and all that. But this is fairly complicated. Clearly, we all want to do that, ideally, right? This graph, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, can, you, can you explain in plain English a little bit better what kind of the principles are there? What is going on there? Why are you moving this? Uh, from the left to the right, closer to the truth there. How, how does it happen? Ah, so, um, <clears throat> thing you have to keep in mind, right? If you, if you, for example, suppose you have currently fit a paramedic regression. So you have fitted your heart disease as a function of your drug and, and some baseline confounders. Here in model. You start adding maybe one covariate, right? Maybe an interaction between treatment and a covariate. Yep. That could certainly make your estimate much better. Uh, it all depends, right? Which covariate is going to be. But how, how do you know that you're moving in the right direction? How do you know that you move to the right, not to the left? That, that, or what it, I mean, you don't know the truth, but how do you know that you're moving in the right direction? It is based on... on, on um, Out, uh, so, for example, you, okay, which covariate? We are going to add one covariate, which is of treatment and the covariate and the confounders. Yep. We are going to add one, and we are asking ourselves the question: one is that if we use that one, then the resulting plug-in estimator of the causal effect will be unbiased, even though the initial regression was wrong. You can work out the mathematics of that, and that's not necessarily intuitive. That is what covariate is. So even the whole initial regression is completely wrong. If you add this clever covariate, all will be removed and be unbiased. That is, uh, and so that is the general principle is that you are looking for the estimator of whatever it is in regression of density. Or, uh, what the object is you're starting out with, you say, okay, can I find a paramedic fluctuation with one for epsilon? So that if I did that with maximum likelihood, suddenly my plug-in estimate is unbiased. That's, that is the mathematical problem behind this. Uh, what sense you can say it's intuitive, the solution, that's a very difficult thing. Fit influence curves is really what drives this. Uh, where it's really what drives uh, the physics theory, the optimal estimators. And so it is not 
uh, these are not that intuitive. Uh, right? That's why I'm, I won't be able to say, oh, of course, uh, every problem, if we get a different kind of problem, we have to rework out this so-called efficient inverse curve, which is going to define this clever covariate or this fluctuation, this parametric fluctuation. Right, right. And I think uh, would we both agree that this is a, a key aspect of TML, what is happening in the circle there? I mean, there are many aspects of the super learning and all that, but it seems to me that this is something that we usually don't do, right, uh, in any of this. This is the key aspect of TMLE is indeed taking initial estimator and fluctuating it according to a parametric fluctuation uh, model. And so this is the step. That's the key step. And that's the key calculations. Every problem needs to go through. Right? By, by now, we have done many, but uh, it's a new mathematical problem which needs to be solved. If you have a different statistical model and a different statistical estimate in mind, to be redone, this whole math problem needs to be solved, and that will then define this, this parametric uh, fluctuation. Any Anybody on the phone who's interested to learn more to try to zoom in on that aspect here in order to fully understand the TMLE? Would you recommend any, any writings of yours or of Susan's or anybody else uh, that can explain what's, what's going on in the circle there? I would, I, I would definitely read uh, the, the, the targeted learning book, uh, okay. which in this slide, the, I suppose these slides are going to be put up somewhere. Uh, but there's a book. With all, uh, which has uh, the first part of the book has introductory explanations, and we tried our very best uh, to make that as real as possible. And it goes into particular into this relatively simple, well, not simple, but estimation of the additive causal effect, but also in more general terms. Right. So that would recommend, uh, but uh, maybe uh, yeah. But there are a bunch of papers written at, at more introductory levels. Uh, Believe I refer to. Any any other questions from the audience out there? We unmute again. Feel free to speak into the microphones. What's the text message there in this field? I also saw something uh, when, when you looked at the the simulated data that the um, page score matching actually. Did well, um, not very optimal, but was very close. Um, was it? Uh, so, so the question, I guess, is to what? Ex yeah, yeah, that's one of those. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I mean, if I would ask you, you probably say, well, that's just in this implementation that it turns out to be very well. Uh, but TMLE is, is, you know, always performing among the best. That that score matching. Uh, has some, uh, actually, here, of course, the point is here that the propensity score matching uses a propensity score, which uses a main term model, which is wrong, because it excludes some interactions. That's what you start seeing, that, of course, then it becomes too biased, right? Here, it's too biased in this example. Uh, the 0.016 is not good, but that's not what you want, right, when you go to such small effects. And that's where using uh, robust estimators, but also starting to replace the propensity score by like a super learner is going to help you. Uh, so, but say, so in principle, propensity score matching can be improved by being sure about how you fit your propensity score, like you have also worked on, Sebastian. Uh, uh, it is still not a double robust estimator, so that means there is no outcome regression involved in that. So that's why some reduction you could be doing, or you are not doing by doing these estimates. Loss. And that's also a loss in efficiency. It's not just bias reduction, but also a loss in efficiency. Uh, anyway, so that it, it's a, it, it is what uh, So uh, just before we go on to section six, just a quick question with regard to, you, you, if I understood it correctly, with these examples that you have used uh, for the super learning, we have very small studies, 200 to 500 people in the studies. Uh, what about studies with 10,000 of subjects? I mean, the, the, the theory, Right, let's, it, it makes the super learner be more important larger the sample size, right? Because now, uh, really, uh, there's no limit of what we can do, and and so uh, it's really a computational issue. Right? Super learning, in if you build a library of 500 algorithms, I mean, you have to do 500 times apply these algorithms to this data set of 10,000 subjects. Let's say, so it takes computer time. So we need parallel computing. Uh, we need and for computing, 
Uh, that's for sure. Uh, it's, I say that computer time is not into finding the optimal weighted combination. That's a triviality. Turning another linear regression. Yep, yep. Real work is into applying each of these estimators or data set and then even on 10 training samples. And we have to tenfold cross the data. Right. So that is the work. And so you can already calculate how much work that will take and, and you can already also see if you would be able to put it on parallel computers uh, or parallel nodes, then you are in business, right? Because then it's just running parallel. Uh, so there's definitely a way to do a lot of speeding up there and uh, but but that's really the main challenge. So, the, but anyway, the larger the data set, the right, it becomes only more important to get into these methods which work on bias reduction, super learning. And that's actually what we see with HTPS as well. Um, the 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 larger the sample, the better it performs. So that is consistent. Uh, should we go on? Since there are no questions right now, why don't we go on to section six uh, and use the last. Um, six minutes on section six, but if any questions come up, why don't you type them into the field and then we read out loud uh, the questions. So Mark, if you can go on. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, so that was uh, the thing I want to talk about is uh, more complex demonstration of, of a kind of data sets which are in this case, uh, <coughs> randomized or observational studies with time to event outcomes, such as time to stroke or that kind of thing, uh, uh, where also people are dropping out, and they're dropping out in response to things you have measured. Uh, so it's dependent covariance. And so we have to deal with the dropout uh, because they induce bias. Uh, and um, in fact, even when dropout is known to be independent, uh, the team utilizes the covariance by essentially imputing failure time. So if somebody drops out and you have knowledge about how sick the person is at that time, even though his dropout was not informed by that, you get imputations and therefore get more efficient estimators. And, and, the, and, and so the, without any risk of getting bias, will improve efficiency, like in randomized trials, where the, where sensing level would, would be non-informative. So he, this is actually an analysis uh, we did with Kaiser, with uh, Alan Go, which was an, a student of mine, Jordan Brooks. This is getting the causal effect of warfarin, virtual warfarin, on time stroke, uh, stroke at one year, uh, stroke or death, I should say. And uh, we have here three estimators reported. This was a data set with something like 30,000 uh, subjects. But because it's repeated measures, there's a lot of, uh, let's say, there's longitudinal it has to be quite a task going back to your computing thing. I mean, so this is already getting into data sets with 13 million rows or so, right? And running super learner. So, and in Jordan Brooks also implemented a super learner package in SAS, uh, which is what he used for this data analysis. So that's maybe also relevant. Uh, anyway, and so what you see here is that uh, the effect observed when you just use two Kepler Myers uh, is actually shrunk down towards zero. But it's there and still quite significant by using these more sophisticated, by using, for example, target mix like here. Uh, why that adjustment happens is actually something uh, we talk about. But that's, and that's pretty interesting. But uh, in hindsight, predictable. Um, here, are, uh, we also did is we analyzed uh, an, uh, the so called CIPO study with Victor de Cortola, which is an. Uh, a randomized trial comparing drugs in, in, uh, in Atlanta trial, and it looks at uh, time till death, till viral failure, that kind of event, find outcomes, and, and informative dropout. And as I said, the treatment was randomized. Here's also some simulations beyond the data analysis. And the simulations, as you see here, is this longitudinal data where you observe covariates, the bank treatment. And an inner of dying, and also an indicator of dropping out. And these intermediate time dependent covariates, which are CD4 count and viral load, which we measured in this study as well. And so you can look at, uh, for example, here is a simulation uh, with time dependent covariates. Uh, and here we have estimators, target mix and likelihood, estimating equation, which is also an efficient methodology, inverse probability sensing weighting. Yet, uh, both PMLE and estimating equation, they're both semi-permetic, double-robust, efficient. They're 
are doing well, they get good coverage, uh, they're also relatively unbiased, their mean rate error is about the same. We see a horrific performance in this case of the inverse probability sensing weighted estimator. Uh, really try to adjust for these time dependent covariates. And one of the problems with this whole machinery many times is that by all that effort to try to adjust for these, these things, it actually gets worse. <laughs> it makes it worse. And of course, there's a real holdback for many people to start using them. That's what you gain with the more robust methodology of target makes some likelihood, which, which doesn't give these crazy answers. Uh, you can also play this game even with independent censoring, uh, because if there's lots of censoring, even though it's independent, these covariates make a big difference. And that's what you see here. Here's some likelihood and estimating equation methodology. There's a lot of censoring, but it's independent. But finite samples, you see that, that uh, TMLE does much better, a factor two better than estimate equation methodology. That has to do with the instability. When there's a lot of censoring, these estimates become unstable. They plug in estimates. And again, PCW is, is suffering. And um, so you see the gain in efficiency. You also gain an efficiency of 50% relative to using baseline covariates here. So you see it really can make a difference to use these time-dependent covariates if you use them right. Uh, what is very interesting is uh, we we looked at misspecification of both censoring and failure time models. And when you start using these estimators <coughs> and you start misspecifying uh, uh, using all models, right, which is what you try to avoid with super learning, but here we just said it, used whatever models were wrong. And, uh, and maybe the most interesting simulation uh, here, for example, you see that uh, removing like the four count from uh, regressions this, uh, causes uh, no bias because the truth is 0 0.47, I believe, and so there's a little bit of bias. Uh, and mean error is fine, uh, so, there's, uh, so it's okay in this case. But here, you see, look at the last, this last table here. Here we removed both, both viral load and CD4 from the models for fitting the censoring and the head regressions. And now we start seeing the estimate equation methodology having a mean element of a probability, a counterfactual probability, of, of 1, 1.24. So that means that's truly horrific. And, uh, IPCW is also very biased. Uh, you'll see is somehow Timely is relatively unbiased. I don't think that makes sense. It just I, I don't know why that happened. Uh, I have some explanation that somehow the targeting still often does remove bias, even when it uses the wrong uh, fit for the censoring mechanism. It still is in the right direction. But anyway, uh, the remarkable instability you see here of estimators uh, we were using previously to deal with these problems. Uh, are so unstable in these situations under domain specification, which was one of the points of, I think, the Kang and Schaefer paper at the time. Okay. Um, uh, so we also used, an, uh, also used methods to analyze uh, uh, the as I said, uh, with outcomes like time to death. Um, and uh, here you see, so here we were interested in estimation of causal effect of the treatment of the mid viral failure death and treatment modification, how that was modified by gender. So there's a difference of two causal effects we are going after. Interaction you want. And you hear that uh, uh, PMLE gives 5% uh, change in effect from males to females. Which is significant. Uh, so do others. Uh, uh, what you see is PCW gives a non-significant result. To see is that actually only using baseline covert would also have done the job. That's it, because if you choose a time event, the mid of viral failure, death, and modification, and the only reason for censoring is end So it's non informative. So we expect that there would be any life. Now we use this outcome death. Now you're going to be modified, going to be censored if you have treatment modification, for example. Now start having serious bias if you don't take into accounts the time dependent covariates. Uh, am I right or am I not? You know, at least some bias, as you see here. This line, you get 5.1. When we start using the time dependent covariates, we get 6.3%. So we really change the effect here. 
and again, uh, IDW is not getting a significant result. So, Mark, I think I think we have to wrap up here. Um, okay. I'm done. Right. There's the book. There we go. <laughs> done. Uh, any any quick question from the audience um, with regard to this last example? Um, if, if not, um, I think that uh, you, you will find Mark uh, Mark's email on his web page and. Um, yeah, the day to email me. Perfect. Thank you. I, I have a lot of good people on the East Coast there who are also very fluent in it. So. Okay, great. Well, thank I'd like you. to answer any questions. All right, Mark. Mark, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, I think this is uh, again opening a window. Uh, we have to all take a closer look to fully understand it. But it was a great introduction. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Bye. Bye, Bye everybody.